So we're going to start chapter 2.4 today. Uh, remember, we've got, you've got the rest of the week to get the test taken. If you haven't taken the test yet, it's, got, it's due by Friday, so make sure you get to take it. Uh, we're going to start on 2.4. We're going to do hopefully 2.4 and 2.5 today. We'll do 2.6 and 2.7 on uh, Monday. We'll do review on Wednesday. So hopefully we'll get through all of this. If not, then we'll push it back and it'll be all right. But hope that's the goal. So what we're going to do in this section is long division, dividing polynomials, synthetic division to divide polynomials, uh, evaluate, evaluating polynomials using something called the remainder theorem, uh, and using the factor theorem to solve polynomial equations. So how do we do long division? Okay, Long division of polynomials is almost identical to doing long division of numbers. Okay, Who here knows how to do long division by hand? If I tell you to divide 25 into 5,327, you would write it out, and you could do that by hand, right? Hopefully. If not, come and see me. We'll talk about it. But uh, hopefully everybody can do regular long division. Long division with polynomials is going to be exact same process. And I'll show you. I'm going to do one side by side so that we see how the processes line up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to arrange the terms, both of the dividend and the divisor, in descending order so that we always start with the highest power and go down. Okay? So step one is to always have them in that order. We're going to divide the first term in the dividend by the first term of the divisor. So do we recognize the difference between the words dividend and divisor? Dividend is what's under the house. Divisor is what is going into it. Okay, so the divisor is on the outside. The dividend is under the house. Uh, so we're going to divide the first term under the house by the first term outside the house. And that's going to give us something that goes on the top. Okay, and that's the first term of the quotient. We're going to multiply each of those terms uh, in the divisor by that first term in the quotient and write the resulting product underneath. And then we're going to uh, line them up and subtract. Okay, so if you're not seeing this, let's think about it in terms of how we do regular long division. 25 into 7823. Now we don't have to arrange terms when we do long division of numerals, right? Because we don't have terms. So we can skip that step, but that's the only step we're going to skip. Divide the first term in the dividend by the first term in the divisor. So really what we're looking at is divide 78 by 25, right? Divide the first piece of the number by what's on the outside. So how many times will 25 go into 78? Three times. So that is the first term, or in this case, the first number of the quotient and we put it on the top. So we're going to do the same thing when we do long division. We're going to say how many times will x go into x squared? And that's x times because x squared divided by x is x. So now what's the next step of long division? We multiply 3 times 25, right? So we're going to multiply our quotient by our terms in our divisor. So 3 times 5 is 20, uh, 15. Carry the 1. 3 times 2 is 6 is 75. We line that up properly so that it's under the correct value. And then what do we do? We subtract that, right? And then we bring down the next term or next number. Okay? So this is the steps that we're going to follow uh, of long division of polynomials too. Bring down the last step. Now, we're going to do this over and over again until we get to the end. And when we get to the end, we should have something that I can't multiply into anymore. We're going to have a remainder a lot of times. And when we have a remainder, that means that the degree of the remainder term is going to be less than the degree of the divisor. Okay, So if you've got x going into whatever, then you're going to just have a number. Because x is to the first power and number is to the zero power. So it's always going to be one less. The way to write a remainder is to say plus whatever the remainder is divided by the divisor. And I know this is all, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. When we start doing it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not worried about the division algorithm. So let's do this. Let's say divide 7 minus 11x minus 3x squared plus 2x cubed by x minus 3. So we're going to do long division. 
So the first thing we want to do is rearrange that first polynomial so that it's in descending order. We always want to start it with the highest power. So we're going to rearrange that as 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 11x plus 7. Okay? Make sure everyone is aware of what it means to be in descending order. We start with third power, uh, third power to second power to first power to no power. Okay? That's what descending order means. Now, once we've got it written like that, we can actually write it out as division. x minus 3 going into 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 11x plus 7. This is how long division looks. It's how long division looked when we did numbers, right? You always have the dividend and the divisor in your house. So we're going to say, what if I got to multiply x by to get to 2x cubed? 2x squared, right? That'll give me 2x cubed. So the 2x squared is your first term of your quotient. Now, just like with numbers, I'm going to multiply my quotient times my divisor. But since it's a binomial, I'm going to have to do it times both factors, or both terms, right? So what's 2x squared times x? 2x cubed, and then 2x squared times negative 3. negative 6x squared. And we're going to make sure to line them up under the proper like term. So this is x cubed, so it goes under the x cubed. This is x squared, so it goes under the x squared. Now when we do long division with numbers, what's the next step? We're going to subtract, right? We're going to do the same thing here. So when we subtract terms, that means we're just going to change the signs of both of them. Okay? If it's a positive, it becomes negative. If it's negative, it becomes positive because you're subtracting. And then we do our addition or subtraction. The first term should always cancel out. That's the whole point of it, right, to get rid of that first term. Now we do negative 3x squared plus 6x squared is going to give us what? 3x squared, and then we bring down the next term. Now, we're going to start the process over, but instead of doing it under the house, we're looking at this term. What have I got to multiply x by to get to 3x squared? 3x, and it's positive 3x, so we say plus 3x. Then we multiply that next term by our divisor. So 3x times x gives us the 3x squared. 3x times negative 3 gives us negative 9x. And then we're going to subtract, so that means we're going to change the signs. That becomes minus, that becomes plus. We do the math, negative 11x plus 9x is negative 2x. Bring down the plus 7. Now, what do I need to multiply x by to get to negative 2x? Negative 2. So negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. We're going to subtract, which means we're going to change the signs. So the negative becomes plus. The plus becomes negative. And we have a 1. Now notice this is a lower degree than x. So that's as far as I can go. That means that 1 is going to be my, my remainder. And I always write it as plus the remainder over the divisor. So plus 1 over x minus 3. So does everybody see how this basically parallels exactly how we do long division normally? Even down to the remainder, we don't really write it as plus something. But if I were to do, you know, 5 into 9... 5 will go into 9 how many times? 1. 1 times 5 is 5. Subtract 4. That means it's going to be 1 and 4 fifths. Right? That's how you would do a remainder for that. You would always put the remainder over the divisor. It's the same deal. Okay? But since we're doing polynomials, it's always going to be plus. We're always adding the next term. It's not... Yes? 
because you're subtracting. So if I'm subtracting a positive, that's minus. If I'm subtracting a negative, that's adding. Right, so it's like, like here. One times five is five, but I need to change that sign by subtracting. So over here, when I said 2x squared times x is positive 2x, to subtract it, I have to say minus. 2x squared times negative gives us negative. But what's negative, negative? If I subtract a negative, it's the same as adding. So it, basically, anytime I subtract anything, it just changes the sign. All right? This is the hard part. You know, long division is probably the, the more challenging way we do division. We're going to do synthetic division, which is actually a little bit easier. The problem with synthetic division is that it's only specific types of problem that synthetic division works on. Long division works no matter what. You can divide anything by anything, and it's going to work as long as your first term uh, or your divisor is a lower power than your dividend. Okay. Now, synthetic division, step one, is to arrange everything in descending order. And if you are missing any terms, okay, say you've got an x cubed, but you don't have an x squared, but you have an x. Anytime you are missing one of the degrees, you have to put a zero in, okay? So if I had x cubed plus 3x plus 4, then that would be x cubed plus 0x squared minus 3x plus 4. I have to have a term for every power, OK? So what we're going to do is, after we've got our polynomial, we're going to look at our divisor. Our divisor is in the form x minus c. Okay, It has to be in this form of x minus c. All I care about is the C, okay? So let me ask you a question. If I'm dividing by X minus 2, what would C be? If my original equation is X minus C, and this is X minus 2, C has to be 2, right? Because if I plug in 2 as C, I get X minus 2. What about if it were X plus 2? then it's going to have to be negative 2. So this is going to be one of those situations where we're going to change the sign because the minus sign forces us to change the sign. Okay? So if I've got x plus 2, my c is negative 2. If I've got x minus 2, my c is positive 2. We always take the opposite sign. Okay? And then we're going to write to the right of that just the coefficients of our polynomial. So the coefficients here, 1, 0, negative 3, positive 4. I don't care about the terms. I don't care about the, the variables. I only care about the coefficients, OK? Now, I'm going to quit reading this and just get to one so that we can see what it looks like, because it's not going to make any sense for me to read all of this stuff to you until I actually show you what we're doing. So let's start by looking at this. I've got x cubed minus 7x minus 6. So I'm missing that square term. So that's the same thing as x cubed plus 0, ooh, 0x zero squared minus 7x minus 6. I'm dividing it by x plus 2. So what is my c? c is equal to negative 2. Right? It's always going to be the opposite sign. So this is how we do synthetic division. We're going to write our C. We're going to put an upside down house that's a little bigger than our C because we want to give us some room. And then we're going to write the coefficients of our polynomial. So we're going to write 1, 0, negative 7, and negative 6. And notice that I left you know, space down here because I'm going to write stuff down there. So let's make sure we have enough room to write stuff down there. So step one is to bring down the first term. All right. 
Step two. We're going to multiply and bounce. So we're going to multiply our C down and bounce it up to the, that empty spot above it. Okay, so we got negative 2 times 1 gives us what? Negative 2. So then our next step is to add coefficients down. So I've got 0 plus negative 2. What's that going to give me? Negative 2. So now I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to multiply and bounce. So I'm going to do negative 2 times negative 2, which is 4, and I'm going to bounce it up here. And then I'm going to add down. What's negative 7 plus 4? Negative 3. Then I'm going to repeat again. I'm going to bounce and multi or multiply and bounce. So negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. What's negative 6 and positive 6? 0. That means I have no remainder. Now I know what you're thinking. If you haven't done this before, you're looking at it going, well, that's just a bunch of numbers. What does that mean? Well, we started with x cubed, which means we're going to drop down to x squared. We're always going to go one less than our previous polynomial. So since we started with an x cubed, we're going to go down to x squared. And we're going to put 1x squared. We're going to decrease it to x and then decrease it to none. So we've got 1x squared minus 2x minus 3. If you have a remainder, we do the same thing we did before. We're going to write plus whatever the remainder is divided by x minus c. In this case, we would over x plus 2 plus 0 over x plus 2. Yeah, since this has no remainder, we could write it as 0 over x plus 2. Yes, sir? Because it's always one less than what we started with. If we started with like x to the fifth, this would be x to the fourth. It's always going to be one less. Okay? Yeah, you, I mean, for simplicity's sake, we wouldn't do that because zero over anything is zero. So I just wanted you to see it so that you know what to do in case you do get a remainder. All right, so does everybody see what I'm doing there? Start with the coefficients, find your C, bring down the first term, multiply and bounce, add, multiply and bounce, add, multiply and bounce, add, just keep doing it until all you've got left is a remainder. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And let's do one that I'll just make up off the top of my head, which will al almost guarantee us that we'll have a remainder. All right. All right, so let's look at x to the 6th plus 7x to the 4th minus 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus x plus 14. And we're going to divide that by x minus 3. All right, so what's my c? c is 3. All right, so what are my coefficients going to be? What's my first coefficient? 1 and then 0, right, because I've got an x to the fifth that's not being represented, so I've got to have a 0 there. And then the 7, negative 3, 2, negative 1 and 14. 1 is from right here. 0 is because I don't have an x to the fifth term. Remember, if you, if you skip any terms, you have to throw a 0 in there. Okay? So now we're going to start by bringing the first term down, multiply and bounce. So 3 times 1 is 3. Add, we get 3. Multiply and bounce, 3 times 3 is 9. Add, 9 times 7, or 9 plus 7 is 16. Multiply and bounce, so 3 times 16 is 48. 
Negative 3 plus 48 is 45. 45 times 3 is 135 plus 2 is 137. Now we multiply and bounce, so 137 times 3, 2, 1, 4, 11. Is that right? Okay. Negative 1 plus 411 is 410. 410 times 3 is 1230. Plus 14 is 1244. All right. <clears throat> so, we started with x to the 6th, which means all of these are going to start with x to the 5th. So this is going to be 1x to the 5th, that's positive 3, so plus 3x to the 4th, plus 16x cubed, plus 45x squared, plus 137x, plus 410, with no x, and then lastly we've got the remainder, so plus 1244 over x minus 3. This is definitely the way to do it if you can do it. Always, you always start one less and then just go down one each time. Yeah, the last one will be your remainder. It's not that it won't work. It's just sometimes it's not, well, sometimes you can't do it. Like if you've got anything other than a binomial, a linear binomial, it's got to be in the form of something x plus or minus something. Uh, and the only way it's going to be clean is if it's x plus a number or x minus a number. What if I want to divide by 2x plus 3? Right here, it's a little harder to see what c is. Here you would take 3 and divide it by 2, so it would be negative 3 halves. So now all of a sudden you're using c as a fraction, and you're going to have a lot uglier numbers. So it may be just quicker to do long division. Now, if you had something like 2x squared plus 5, that's not linear. I can't do synthetic division on it at all if it's not linear. It's got to only be to the first power. It can't be any other power. Okay? So that's how, that's when it's going to fail. You're not going to be able to use. And this will work if I have, say, x divided by x is exactly the same. Probably still be simpler in that case. Like, I'm trying to think of a number that's like this. If you had uh, 3x. Well, if you had just 3x, if you just had a monomial, no, there's no reason to do it because you would just split it up into, you know, x6 divided by 3x, you know, 7x to the fourth divided by 3x. You would just separate it into separate fractions. There'd be no reason to do it. All right. So now that leads us to something called the remainder theorem. If we have a polynomial divided by x minus c, we know that the remainder... If the polynomial f of x is divided by x minus c, then the remainder is, no, it's not. f of c. If we have a polynomial f of x and we divide it by x minus c, then the remainder is f of c. It's the same thing that we would get if we plugged c into our function. So what does that mean? Given f of x equals 3x cubed plus 4x squared minus 5x plus 3, use the remainder theorem to find f of negative 4. So f of negative 4, that's f of c. That means that c is negative 4. So if I do synthetic division on this using c equals negative 4, whatever the remainder is will be f of negative 4. Okay. So I'm going to say negative 4 into 3, 4, negative 5, 3. Bring down the 3, multiply and bounce. 
multiply and bounce, multiply and bounce, uh, 108, negative, negative 105. So my remainder is negative 105. That means f of negative 4 equals negative 105. Is there an easy way to check that and verify that's true? Right. We can find f of any number, right? We just plug that number into our function. So we get 3 times negative 4 cubed plus 4 times negative 4 squared minus 5 times negative 4 plus 3. So that's going to give us 3 times negative 64 plus 4 times 16 plus 20 plus 3. So that gives us 12, 18, 192, negative 192 plus 64 plus 20 plus 3. So negative 192 plus 64 is negative 128 plus 20 plus 3. So that's negative 108 plus 3, which is negative 105. So it works out that, yes. So here's the kicker. If you don't remember how to do the remainder theorem, that's okay, right? Because there's another way to solve that problem. You can just plug the value into the function and get your answer. So just because, particularly on a computerized piece of homework or computerized test, which we have in here, if the problem said, use the remainder theorem to find f of negative 4, do you have to? You don't have to, right? You can just plug f of you know negative four into the function and get the answer. So you can at least check your work Absolutely. It gives you a really good way of checking your answer to make sure that you got it right. Okay. All right. Now we have the factor theorem. Factor theorem tells us that we have a function that's a polynomial. If we know that the polynomial is equal to zero, okay, then x minus c is a factor of f of x. If f of c is equal to zero, I don't know why I keep, it keeps saying f of x. If f of c is zero, then x minus c is a factor of f of x. All that means is that if I plug c in and I get 0, that means it's a 0 of the function, right? It means it's an x-intercept. That means x minus c has to be a factor because that's how we found x-intercepts, right? We would factor it when it was set equal to 0 and set each one of the factors equal to 0. It's the same thing. It's just a different way of saying it. And it also tells us that if f of x or if x minus c is a factor, then we know that f of c is equal to 0. That just means that c is a 0 to x-intercept, okay? If f of c is 0, yes. All right, so if 15x cubed plus 14x squared minus 3x minus 2 equals 0, and we're given that negative 1 is a 0, can we solve the entire equation, which means get all of the zeros? Given one 0, can we find the rest of them? Well, we don't want to factor out anything because it's not a factor yet, okay? What is a factor? X plus 1 is a factor, right? Because I know that if negative 1 is a 0, then X minus negative 1 is a factor. Not important in the scheme of things that it's a factor. What is important is that if negative 1 is a 0, then I should be able to use synthetic division And I should have no remainder, right? If, if negative 1 is a 0, I shouldn't have a remainder left over because I know that f of negative 1 will be 0. Therefore, the remainder would have to be 0 by the remainder theorem, okay? So bring the 15 down. 15 times negative 1 is negative 15. Add, you get negative 1. Negative 1 and negative 1 is positive 1. That gives us negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2. Gives us no remainder. Well, that's awesome. But why is that awesome? We started with a cubic, right? What does that make this? Squared, right? It's quadratic. I can solve quadratic equations all day long, right? 
I can either use the quadratic equation or I can factor. So this means that this is 15x squared minus x minus 2. If I set that equal to 0, then I can say factor this. 15 will be 3x and 5x. 2 will be 2 and 1. I need it to be negative, so negative plus. That will factor as 3x plus 1, 5x minus 2. Is everybody good with that? Is everybody strong in their factoring skills? Yes. You either factor it or use quadratic equation. And some people may just be more comfortable just using the quadratic equation because it's always going to work and you don't have to spend the time trying to factor. Okay? But that also means that you have to know the quadratic formula, right? Which everyone knows, right? Yeah, it's exactly what it is. That's all we're doing is finding all of the zeros. That's what solve the equation means when it's set equal to zero, right? The only way we know how to solve any equation is to make sure it's set equal to zero and then factor it, okay? So that means that 3x plus 1 equals zero and 5x minus 2 equals zero. Subtract 1, divide by 3, x equals negative 1 third. Add 2, divide by 5, x equals 2 fifths. So what is the solution to this equation? We've got negative one-third. We've got two-fifths. What else do we have? Negative one. negative one, which was a given. We know we have to have three solutions. How do we know we have to have three solutions? It's right. It's a third-degree polynomial, right? Quadratic equation? Absolutely. So if this is A, this is B, and C, right? So A equals 15, B equals negative 1, C equals negative 1. So we're going to, instead of factoring it, this time we're going to use quadratic equation. So negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So negative negative 1 is positive 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared is 1, minus 4 times a, which is going to give me 60, times negative 1, which is negative 60, so... You're right. It is. So that's going to give me 120. Over 2 times 15, which is 30. So we've got 1 plus or minus root 121 over 30, but what's the square root of 121? So we've got 1 plus or minus 11 over 30. So if we look at those as two separate answers, 1 plus 11 over 30 is 12 over 30. 1 minus 11 is negative 10 over 30. Simplify those down, and we get 2 fifths and negative 1 third which is the same answers. Either way works. We get the same answer either way. It just kind of depends on whether your, uh, your mojo is better with factoring or quadratic equation, quadratic formula, okay? But anytime we say solve the equation, we're going to use, if it's higher, if it's higher degree than two, we don't really know how to do it, right? We don't have skills to factor third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, whatever. But if we're given some of the zeros, then we can knock it down a power by using each one of the zeros. So if I gave you a fifth degree polynomial and I gave you three different zeros, you should be able to use one of them to knock it down to a fourth, use another one to knock it down to a third, use another one to knock it down to a quadratic, and then use quadratic formula to solve for the other two long but doable right. 
Yeah, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's do a new slide. So let's say... Let's say... I need to figure it out real quick. Okay. So we've got f of x equals x to the fifth plus 2x to the fourth minus 3x cubed minus 18x squared minus 32x minus 8. And I tell you that 1, negative 1, and negative 2 are all zeros. Can I solve it? Can I find the other zeros? Okay. So we'll start by doing synthetic division with one of the zeros. So we'll start with, say, 1. So that gives me x to the fifth, 2x to the fourth, negative 3x cubed, negative 18x squared, negative 32, and negative 8. Now this should work out so that I have no remainder, and it will knock it down from an x to the fifth to an x to the fourth. So 1, 1 times 1 is 1, 3, 3 is 0, is 0, is negative 18, is negative 8. Well, that's not right. <laughs> Two, four, four is negative three, negative two, negative three, negative eighteen. Oh, because I'm have messed up. All right, scratch all that, y'all. I'm a bad a bad mathematician. Give me one second. Plus x. So that's gonna be x cubed plus x squared plus x squared. x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 2x squared
cubed times x squared minus 4x minus 8. All right, so let's try this one. x to the fifth. plus 5x to the 4th plus 9x cubed plus 3x squared minus 10x minus 8. 1, 5, 9, 3, negative 10, negative 8. Fingers crossed. So 1, 1 times 1 is 1, is 6, is 6, is 15, is 15, is 18, is 18, is 8, is 8, is 0. All right, so it worked that time, so that makes me feel a little better. So we knocked it down from a fifth degree polynomial to a fourth degree polynomial. I don't have to rewrite this out as a, you know, 1x to the fourth, 6x cubed. There's no reason, because I'm just going to have to rewrite it again as synthetic to do the next zero. So I did one, now let's do negative one. So that's going to be one, negative one, five, negative five, ten, negative ten, eight, negative eight, zero. So I've knocked it down from a fifth to a fourth to a third. Okay? So now I'm going to use the last remaining zero to knock it down again. So one, negative two, 3, negative 6, 4, negative 8, 0. So now I have x squared plus 3x plus 4. So I want to factor that, which I can't. It's not factorable, but I can use the quadratic formula. So a equals 1, b equals 3, c equals 4. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, so 16, over 2 times a, which is 2 times 1. Negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 9 minus 16, negative 7 over 2. Negative 3 plus or minus i root 7 over 2. Or negative 3 plus or minus negative 3 halves plus or minus root 7 over 2 i. Now, that gave us an imaginary answer, right? It's not really going to be helpful in this situation because we're only looking for real zeros. So we would, we would only have the three real zeros that we were given, and then we solved for the two complex zeros that are not really practical. Okay? But that's how you would do it given a problem that where you were given multiple zeros and you needed to find all of them. Okay? All right, so let's take this, what we've learned here, and start applying it to finding zeros. That's what we're going to do in the next section. So we're going to use something called the rational zero theorem to find possible rational roots. Then we're going to find all of the zeros. We're going to be able to solve for polynomial equations. We're going to use linear factorization theorem to find a polynomial that has a given set of zeros, and we're going to use Descartes' rule of sign. Uh, Descartes' rule of sign is stupid. All right. Say we've got a polynomial, and it's got integer coefficients, and p divided by q is a rational, uh, or is reduced to its lowest terms. Okay. So we're talking about. Well, you don't tell what P and Q is. Ah, oh, this thing irks me. We're going to say P should be A sub 0. Q is going to be A sub N. P is the constant term. Q is the front term when they are factors. Okay? So I'm going to take all of the possible factors of the constant term divided by all of the possible factors of the leading coefficient, and all of those could possibly be factors. Okay? 
So if I were to ask you, what are the possible factors? What are the possible zeros of this polynomial? We're going to start by factoring the constant term. What's the constant term? Negative 3. It's the term without a variable, right? In this case, it's negative 3. So what are all of the possible factors of negative 3? 1 and 3. 1 and 3. What else? Negative 1 and negative 3, right? Negatives will go into positives just fine. So we've got plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. Plus or minus. Right, but one of them could be negative, though. I'm saying that negative 1 times positive 3 is negative 3. Therefore, negative 1 and positive 3 are both factors. Yes. Positive 1 and negative 3 multiply together. Therefore, positive 1 and negative 3 are both factors. Okay? The Not at the same time. Yeah, it's a, it's a now, what about the leading coefficient? What's our leading coefficient? just 4, right? It's the number on the front. Just the number, not the variable. So what are our possible factors of 4? 4, one, two, three, plus or minus. plus or minus 1, plus or minus 4 right away, and then plus or minus 2. So to get all of the possible rational zeros, we're going to divide all of the top numbers by all the bottom numbers. Okay, so we say 1 divided by 1, 1 divided by 4, 1 divided by 2, 3 divided by 1, 3 divided by 4, 3 divided by 2. All of them plus or minus. So we get plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1 fourth, plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 3 fourths, plus or minus 3 halves. It's possible that any of these could be. It doesn't guarantee that any of them will be. It just means that if there is a zero, it has to be one of these things. Okay? No, it's not why it is, but it is a good example of why that works. Because if the zero, if it were on the bottom, then we would have division by. Okay. Right. Uh, it's just a byproduct. Now, what purpose does this serve us? I've got 4x to the fifth, right? If I want to find the zeros of this function, but I'm not given any zeros. Right. Instead of just picking a random number out of nowhere to try to do synthetic division on to test and see if it's a zero, now I have a list of possibilities. Okay? Now I'm going to start almost exclusively with one and test it. I'll say, well, does one go into it? So I can do synthetic division using one. If it does, awesome. That knocked us down to a fourth degree polynomial. I can try something else. If not, then I go to the next one, maybe negative 1. Then I use 3 and negative 3 because it's easier to use integers than it is to use fractions. Okay? So the goal is to use this rational zero theorem and synthetic division to knock down our polynomial into something a little easier to use. Hopefully enough that I can get it down to a quadratic. Okay? So, find all of the zeros of x cubed plus x squared minus 5x minus 2. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of a, it's not really a shortcut, but if our leading coefficient is 1, that only factor of 1 is plus or minus 1, right? 
So really, all I have to worry about are the factors of the constant term. Okay? Which in this case is just plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. Which numbers? This is the constant term. The leading coefficient is the term in front of the first variable. Right. So when we did this one, the constant term was negative 3. So that's what we, where we got the plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3. And then the leading coefficient was 4. That's where we got 1 and 4 and 2. Those are all factors of 4. You see it? Okay. So here we're looking at plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 divided by 1, but we don't have to worry about divided by 1, right? So we're going to start by testing any of these roots. And what did I say the easiest one to start with is? 1. So we read x cubed squared to the first. They're all there, so 1, 1, negative 5, negative 2. We're just going to do synthetic division and try out positive 1. So bring down the 1. 1 times 1 is 1. Bring down the 1 is 2, 2 is negative 3, negative 3, negative 5. Did that give us a 0 for our remainder? No. no, that means that 1 is not a 0. So now we go to negative 1. So 1 bring it down, multiply, 0, 0 is negative 5, is 5 is 3. Didn't get a zero as a remainder, therefore that's also not a zero. All right, so bring down the one. One times two is two, it's three, it's six, it's one, it's two, it's zero. Aha, so two is a zero. And that leaves us with the equation x squared plus three x plus 1 equals 0, which we can't factor, but we can use the quadratic equation on. So a equals 1, b equals 3, c equals negative 1. So we've got negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, so plus 4 over 2 times a, negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 13 over 2. Why is he I don't know. That's a good question. Because it's one of those days. Apparently I have trouble with C. That's the second one I've put the wrong C on, isn't it? All right, so what are our zeros? If we wrote it as three separate things, we've got 2, we've got negative 3 plus root 5 over 2, and negative 3 minus root 5 over 2. Three separate solutions. So does everybody see that we're going to use the rational root theorem to figure out possible zeros? Then we're going to use synthetic division to narrow it down and find an actual zero. And once we've done it enough times, then we've got a quadratic. We can just use the quadratic formula on. Now let me ask you a question. If we started with something like x to the fifth, and I discovered that uh, 1 didn't work, negative 1 didn't work, 2 worked, and then I've got something with a fourth degree polynomial. If 2 works only one time, or if 2 works one time, does that mean it only works one time, or should I try it again? Well, you should try it again. Because we have that possibility of having multiplicity greater than 1, right? 2 could be a root more than one time. So just because 2 works once doesn't mean you shouldn't try it again. Always try that number again to make sure it doesn't have a multiplicity higher than 1, okay?
All right. So here are some properties of roots of polynomial equation. We know this stuff already. If a polynomial is of degree n, then how many possible or how many separate roots does it have? It has n roots, right? We know that. It's kind of the definition that we talked about earlier, where if you have multiplicities, you have to add the multiplicities to get the uh, uh, degree. But we know we'll have at least n zeros. If a plus bi is a root, if we have a complex solution, then a minus bi also has to be a root. What are a plus bi and a minus bi? What do we call that? What? No. Complex conjugates, right. A plus bi, a minus bi are conjugates. If we have the same thing with one's plus and one's minus. So if if you ever have a complex solution, you know you're going to have two of them and they're going to be complex conjugates. Okay? So, let's solve x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 22x squared minus 30x plus 13 equals zero. What are my possible zeros here? Yes, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 13. Okay? Because those are the factors of that constant term over the factors of the leading coefficient 1. So, we know we could try positive 1, negative 1, positive 13, and negative 13. Which one do we want to try first? Let's see, let's try 1. So, x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared, x, and then constant. So bring down the 1, multiply and bounce, add. Multiply and bounce, add. Multiply and bounce, add. Multiply and bounce, add. 1 is a root. All right? But now we're in a cubic. We're not in a square, right? We haven't gotten down to a quadratic, so we're going to have to do it again to try to get down one more time. So I did one, now what do I need to do? I need to do one again. I need to test it just to make sure it doesn't have a multiplicity of two. So if we try one, we get one, one, negative four, negative four, 13, 13. Ha ha, see? what I tell you? Be careful, make sure that you try those roots more than once. Because here we had one with a multiplicity of two. Well, at this point, we've got a quadratic. So we can stop and just do quadratic formula. Okay? We can't factor it because there's no two factors that multiply together to be 13 and add to be negative 4. So we're having to do a equals 1, b equals negative 4, and c equals positive 13, right? Okay. So negative b is 4 plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, 4 times 13, 2, 1, 52, over 2 times a is 2. So 4ac, b squared minus 4 times a times c. So that's going to give us 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 minus 52 gives us negative 36 over 2. But that's 4 plus or minus 6i over 2. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. 6i divided by 2 is 3i. So we should have four solutions. We have 1 with a multiplicity of 2. Then we've got 2 plus 3i and its complex conjugate 2 minus 3i. Now when we do the solution set, we do not have to write 1 more than one time. But we do recognize that it has a multiplicity of 2, so we do have 2, 3, 4 solutions. Okay? But now we see why 
roots will always pop up in complex <coughs> conjugates, right? It's because of the quadratic formula. This is a plus or minus. So if it's something plus something, it's also going to be something minus something. So that's where the complex conju conjugate comes into play. All right, so we are going to talk about this for just a second. I don't remember if I told you all this at the beginning of the semester that we would come across the fundamental theorem of algebra. I think I did. I think I mentioned this and how stupid it was. So if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than 1, then the equation f of x equals 0 has at least one complex root. Okay. This goes back to when we talked about the definition of what complex numbers were. A complex number is not just an imaginary number, right? Real numbers are also complex. They just have a plus zero i, so they have no imaginary part. They are still complex, okay? So basically what this says is any polynomial has a root. Yeah, duh. That, I mean, we've only done that since the beginning is solve equations for their zeros. And that's all it says. Why it has to say it's a complex root, I don't know, because everything is complex. There's nothing that's not complex. Real numbers are complex. Imaginary numbers are complex. So all it says is it has at least one root, the most useless theorem, in my opinion, that we will come across. And it's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. So everything equals zero at some point. <laughs> Eventually either imaginarily or really. So we're going to stop there. We're going to pick up linear factorization on Monday.